I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Perlman. Dr. Perlman serves as the NAF Medical Research serves on the NAF Medical Research Advisory Board. She is NAF's Board of uh, Directors, and is NAF, she's on NAF's Board of Directors. Excuse me, and she is NAF's Medical Director. She is Clinical Professor of Neurology and Director of the Ataxia Center at UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles. Dr. Perlman has worked with NAF and with Ataxia for a full, well, more than over 30 years. And she's networked with other Ataxia specialists throughout the United States and throughout the world. She helped develop the National Ataxia Database. She has worked on seven clinical drug, tri drug trials. And she is currently participating in two natural history studies on dominant Ataxias and free rights Ataxia. And since she has uh, plenty of time to spare, she hopes to expand the work being done in, non, in the non-genetic ataxias, and we look forward to uh, hearing from her about that in the future. So please welcome Dr. Perlman. Thank you so much. Um, it's been a, a long and productive week. I'm a little homesick for my family, but it is so worth it to be here to network with all of my friends, um, the other docs who are doing the same thing I am around the country, um, and also to network with you. I'm kind of much better one-to-one. -one. Um, I, I don't do large groups well, um, but you know, I really look forward to, kind of a weird way to put it, meeting with my patients in my office and just sitting down with them and talking about what's going on, how they're feeling, um, what their other docs are doing with them. Um, so I'm going to try to present managing ataxia as, as if you were in the office with me and it, it was one-on-one. -on -one. So there's the disclaimer from NAF. Um, I have been working with a number of pharmaceutical companies um, as a clinical trial site, but I don't have any personal relationships with any of them. So, so you have ataxia. You've received that diagnosis. Um, you may know more or less about it. You may have already gone to the Internet, um, gone to Dr. WebMD um, to try to find out what ataxia is. But I think the key thing is you, you have to get in the driver's seat. You have to take control. Um, and I found this cute um, picture online, you know, about, uh, you know, user information instruction manuals. And if your user information even vaguely resembles an airplane cockpit, you're doing it wrong. And sometimes, you know, certainly after the first three days of the ataxia investigators meeting, I kind of felt like that. Um, I entered it excited. All my friends were here, you know, new research, you know, stuff I'd been hearing about. I could finally see all the charts and graphs. And by the end of those three days, I was actually anxious. How was I going to remember all this? How was I going to put it into practice? Um, so it can absolutely help to have a co-pilot. Um, not a caregiver necessarily, but somebody that you can bounce ideas off of, you can discuss questions you may have. It doesn't have to be a doctor. It could be another individual with ataxia who seems to understand and have the same concerns that you have. It could be a family member. It could be, um, you know, a doctor who doesn't treat you for ataxia but treats you for something else but is a good sounding board. And I just had that experience with a patient who has an un- diagnosed ataxia. She definitely has ataxia, but we don't know the exact causes. We have a number of clues. We don't think it's genetic. There were some questions about whether it was an immune system problem, and there were a few things that came up on her blood work. So I sent her to one of my colleagues in rheumatology, and, you know, looking at his notes now, which I did last night when I was, you know, kind of doing emails and, and you know, refilling electronic prescriptions, um, he has really clarified a lot of things for her about the role of her immune system. Um, and she probably asked him the same questions that she asked me. But, you know, in his note, it was clear that he was able to give a better focus on it and can help her focus on where she wants to go with future treatment. So I, I think you do have to have somebody that you know will answer your questions in a straightforward way. And it doesn't necessarily have to be your neurologist. So welcome to my office. This is what goes on when um, 
Somebody comes in for a first visit, they come in for a follow-up visit, um, and this is literally a checklist of everything that we go through. Sometimes the medications are more important, sometimes there are questions about equipment. I think one of the other advantages of the electronic medical record, besides the ability to e-prescribe, is that I actually have a computer and a printer in my office. So if somebody asks me a question about a piece of equipment that they've seen, you know, I can pull it up on my computer, turn the screen around, say, is this what you're talking about? I can print out things right there so that when they leave, they actually have not the list of you're going to do this with your medication, you're going to do this with your exercise, this is the blood work we have to do, you know, and then here are, you know, the equipment you're going to investigate, here's the flyer for the place that may carry it, so that, you know, people can leave actually with homework that they can accomplish because we've, you know, come to this treatment plan together. So we're going to go through each of these um, areas and, you know, basically just discuss them the way I would discuss them with a patient or family that I'm seeing. So obtaining a diagnosis. Um, sometimes it's the question that's key on the first visit. Sometimes it continues to be a question every time the individual comes in because you haven't re really nailed it down yet. And I know we've been, you know, making little comments in some of the birds of a feather about how long it takes to get a diagnosis and how the doctor says, well, come back in six months, come back in 10 years, you know, maybe we'll know more by then. So I think getting an accurate diagnosis um, is, is sometimes very complex, like that, you know, cockpit of an airplane. But it is a question that may come up one time and it's solved, but it may be a recurring question. You may have to look more closely at your symptoms. Your symptoms may be changing, and you need to bring that up. A new symptom that comes on may actually be the key to unlock what the cause of your ataxia is. Um, some of the common symptoms that, that people with ataxia experience, feeling off balance, feeling clumsy, feeling dizzy or woozy, could easily be due to a simple inner ear problem or a vision issue or a neuropathy. Um, and these are very common diagnoses, and sometimes people will get these as their very first diagnosis. Oh, you're having a balance problem. It's probably your inner ear. I'll send you to a physical therapist for inner ear therapy. Um, I have a tremor. You go on WebMD and it says, oh, you probably have Parkinson's. Or your doctor, you know, may not be familiar with different types of tremor and may say, well, you have a tremor. It's probably Parkinson's um, because it's very common. And I think in medical school, we were all taught to look for things that are common and to look for things that are treatable. And then you start chasing zebras. So some docs kind of stick with the common stuff and will offer you treatments for common things that may not be what you have. But it is absolutely possible to do inner ear testing to rule that out, to have your vision checked by somebody who understands how vision can interfere with balance um, to make sure that it's not just an eye problem. Um, there are tests that can confirm that you have a neuropathy that is altering, you know, your foot feel and floor feel and making your balance worse. Um, and a movement disorder specialist or most um, good general neurologists can recognize Parkinson's and can recognize when a tremor is not Parkinson's. Um, unexplained falls. Um, maybe the only thing that's going on is, you know, you've had two or three falls in, within three months and, and you can't figure out why. Um, maybe it's a trick knee. Maybe it's foot drop from something and you're tripping on your foot. Maybe you actually have some weakness and you have trouble holding yourself up against gravity. Um, it could be fainting spells. It could be seizures. And these are common causes of falls. And certainly in older people, you know, over the age of 65 or 70, you know, falls are a huge risk because they often have vision problems, a little neuropathy, some weakness, um, maybe some inner ear problems. They're on medications that lower their blood pressure and make them dizzy. So that an older person with a balance problem who comes into their doctor saying, you know, I've been falling, their doctor's going to go through all of those things first. And depending on the amount of time you have to spend with him, he may get stuck with, well, you're on this medicine that could be lowering your blood pressure. Let's change that medicine. And you come back again and the problem is still there. So the diagnostic process sometimes can be a little dragged out 
and get caught in little detours um, and dead ends. But you need to ferry your doctor through that. They need to know that you have a new symptom and this could be important. Or you, know, you change my blood pressure medicine, I'm still falling. Um, so that probably wasn't it. You need to be a good communicator. And sometimes your co-pilot can help you with that. You know, they can come with you to the clinic visit and make sure that the information gets out. Um, my father, my mother, brother, third cousin, twice removed, had a walking problem. But it was due to alcohol use, it was a back injury, it was arthritis, it was old age. Um, you know, many doctors don't take a detailed family history. And if you, you know, if they ask you if anybody in your family has had any neurologic problems or walking difficulties, well, my grandmother had a walking problem, but it was Parkinson's. Um, and my mother had multiple sclerosis. And finally, somebody gets around to figuring out that that person has spinocerebellar ataxia type 3, and all those prior generations had spinocerebellar ataxia type 3. So sometimes it just really is. Everybody's got these little problems, and, you know, they all share the fact that they have trouble getting around, but it really is all different stuff. On the other hand, it could well be a genetic factor. And, you know, if you are into genealogy and are good at tracking down family members and keeping track of how people are doing, it can be very helpful to your doctor. Um, and it may take up half your visit, and you may have to have another visit to go over other issues. But at least you'll keep a list of the, th the topics you want to cover and the things that are going to help your doctor make your diagnosis. Um, all of these scenarios clumsiness, tremor, unexplained falls, deserve a trip to a neurologist. You may have a really good GP, but these are neurologic symptoms, and you should have at least one visit with a neurologist to have a good neuro exam. Um, brain MRI can be helpful for ruling out the you know, brain tumors, strokes, um, multiple sclerosis, things that show up easily on brain imaging. Um, and I still see ataxia patients who have never had a brain MRI. Um, often it's Friedreich's ataxia patients. Um, the diagnosis is fairly straightforward to make, and you know the brain MRI usually doesn't add anything, but you're not immune from other conditions. So I think it's helpful for somebody with a brain problem, nervous system problem, to have at least one brain MRI over the course of their, um, of their evaluation. So brain MRI, the one on the left with the two little white arrows, um, shows a very small amount of thinning of the cerebellum, and that's what those little arrows are pointing at. There's a round um, object right next to the top arrow, which is the pons, and that stick that that round object is sitting on is the brain stem. And if I can use a pointer without accidentally doing something, um, there's the cerebellum with a little bit of thinning. You know, there should be a little more gray stuff there as opposed to the black um, space around it. This round thing is the pons. Looks pretty good. Brain stem looks pretty good. You get down to the spinal cord because it's a Friedreich's ataxia patient. That's a little thin as well. The um, other one on the right shows a large amount of atrophy of the cerebellum and brain stem. And I put the reference that I took that from. And there you can see there's a lot more of the black space around the cerebellum in the back of the head there. And the pons, instead of being nice and round, is kind of flat and thin. So the brain MRI can help rule out other things besides the ataxias that we're all familiar with. But it can also help rule in a problem affecting the cerebellum only, affecting the cerebellum and the pons or brain stem or affecting the spinal cord more than the cerebellum. And this can help your doctor start sorting out all the different options, certainly for the genetic ataxias where there are hundreds of options, hundreds of genes that are known, many of which can be tested for at the cost of thousands of dollars. So if your brain MRI can give you a little direction towards what the next set of appropriate tests would be, You'll be using your health care more efficiently, and you'll probably get an answer more quickly. Other lab work everyone should have done. And I've taken this um, little chart right here from an algorithm that Dr. Fogel put together um, that you know, a couple of other people I've worked with over the years have tried to systematize 
all the blood work you could ever have done. Um, and it's, it's listed here. He, he refers to these as general studies that everybody should think about having done. Um, and there's first line tests in the, um, you know, kind of the first column, second line tests, and then third line tests far to the right. Um, many of these tests, you know, we do to, quote, be complete. Um, many of the tests represent things that are treatable causes of ataxia. And going back to my medical school days, you want to find things that are treatable so you can start treatment right away. So vitamin deficiencies, um, toxic problems, immune system problems are very treatable and should be looked for. And even if there is a genetic ataxia in your family, you're not immune from other things. And you could have a vitamin deficiency. You could have some immune system changes that are contributing to the symptoms that you're having. So I think um, one thing I've seen in the last five years is that more and more patients are coming to me who have already had most of the first and second line tests done by their outside neurologist. So that the word is getting out there, that there's a set of tests that are important for people with cerebellar disease and that these things should be done and that they may have treatable outcomes. And more and more of the general neurology um, practitioners are recognizing that. So that's that that's good. Who should have genetic testing? Um, Common adult genetic ataxias, you know, all of the ones I've listed there, SCA 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 8, 17, and DERPLA are um, triplet repeat ataxias. Um, the first four, 1, 2, 3, and 6, are the most common ones. Um, fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome is seen um, in older adults who have a very small mutation in the fragile X gene as opposed to the very large mutations that can cause mental retardation in their grandchildren. Um, and this was discovered when people coming to clinic with their children with fragile X mental retardation, it began to be noted that the grandfathers of these kids um, had ataxia and work was done to uncover this um, as you know, not a common cause of ataxia or tremor, um, in an older person, but certainly one that you can diagnose, and there's research going on for it, so it's worth looking for. And there is late onset Friedreichs, so um, FRDA gene testing is, I think, appropriate for an older person, somebody over the age of 30, with ataxia. The common childhood onset genetic ataxia is Friedreichs, obviously, ataxia telangiectasia. Um, AOA 1 and 2, ataxia with ocular motor apraxia types 1 and 2, and there's now 3 and 4, which are rarer, um, certainly should be part of an initial screen for a child with childhood onset cerebellar disease. Um, and on the right-hand side, um, I have, you know, some simpler non-genetic tests that can be used um, as kind of biomarkers. Alpha fetoprotein, if it's elevated in a child with ataxia, you immediately think ataxia telangiectasia as it's elevated in most of those children. Um, immunoglobulins may be changed. Um, albumin and um, creatine phosphokinase, um, which is a, an enzyme you can measure in blood, can be changed in AOA1 and AOA2. So even as part of very general blood work, and those tests are often appear on general blood work, you might get a clue that you're dealing with a more specific genetic problem. So, you know, my recommendation for people, even without a family history, um, is to get, you know, appropriate genetic testing for the common adult ataxias or the common pediatric onset ataxias to start. Now, up to 5% of people with ataxia with no family history may have one of these common genes. There have been a couple of studies done looking at the occurrence of these common genes, you know, SCA 1, 2, 3, and 6 in particular, in people with ataxia and no family history. 5% family history was lost. Um, earlier generations had a milder form of it, and it was misdiagnosed as Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis. So it's absolutely worth having genetic testing, even if you don't have a family history. 
Exome sequencing has been talked about a lot. Um, certainly may uncover more genes, may uncover rarer genes. Um, what we do at UCLA is once we work through the common genetic factors and you know, the triplet repeat disorders, um, which don't show up on exome sequencing, um, if we have a strong feeling from the way the person's symptoms are developing um, that there could be a genetic factor, then we will send exome sequencing. And Dr. Fogel has an article that's coming out in this month's Practical Neurology. It's a journal that goes out to all neurologists and general neurologists. It's the cover article about um, ordering and using genetic testing and exome sequencing to help win the battle against insurance companies that may not um, uh, approve it. Um, they may, you know, just refuse to pay for it, and and then people will may not have access to it because it can be expensive, you know, from one to three thousand dollars or sometimes more. But genetic testing, I think, should be a part of everyone's evaluation. The effects of a hidden cancer um, in somebody who's in the first five years of their ataxia symptoms. Um, even if there is a family history, I think it's appropriate to think that there could be an underlying hidden cancer that is making bad antibodies that are attacking the cerebellum. Um, the malignancy workup includes imaging of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, a mammogram, you know, testicular ultrasound, a body PET scan sometimes, and there's blood work that can be done to try to look for these bad antibodies. Um, I have one individual, I have probably a lot of individuals, but I have one in particular who had 20 years of a slowly progressive ataxia. Um, you know, he was walking with a cane, um, you know, had to be careful on stairs, but it was changing extremely slowly. And I had followed him for a good 10, 15 years of that 20 year history. All of a sudden he started getting worse. And... Um, you know, he came with a walker and then six months later he came in a wheelchair and I thought this is unusual um, that you should be changing this quickly. So we worked him up again looking for vitamin deficiencies, you know, bad antibodies. We found a bad antibody that probably had appeared in his immune system sometime within, you know, those couple of years that he was getting worse. We treated him for the bad antibody, intravenous immunoglobulin, IVIG. And he's back to walking with a cane again. So we didn't get rid of his whole ataxia because there's probably other factors behind that. But that change in his course, you know, enabled us to go back and take a second look and actually do something that, that was helpful. So I think we need to think about bad, you know, the immune system, bad antibodies, as I refer to them, or, or a possible small hidden cancer. Multiple system atrophy has been mentioned, and in the hierarchy of types of ataxia, in general, it's felt to be non-genetic. There's a group in um, Japan that in some of their MSA families have, you know, a brother and sister or two siblings that have MSA, suggesting maybe there is a genetic risk factor. They did um, what was essentially exome sequencing and found a genetic factor that was involved in the metabolism of CoQ10, um, which protects our brain and our nervous system. They then looked at people from European um, databases with MSA and did not find that genetic change. But the, the search is on for genetic risk factors for MSA that could be setting people up to develop this disorder which is classified amongst the sporadic ataxias as it's felt to be not non-genetic. It's not primarily genetic. Um, and we may be learning more about it and about the bad protein that builds up the alpha synuclein with some of the good research that was presented at the um, AIM meeting and um, that is still going on actively at many of our ataxia research centers. So the things that... Um, separate multiple system atrophy from garden variety idiopathic late onset cerebellar ataxia is that it becomes, it goes from being a straightforward ataxia to being more complicated. People may develop signs of Parkinson's, a tremor or slowing that you would typically see in a Parkinson's patient. They may develop changes in the autonomic nervous system as, as was presented the other day. 
um, where they'll have blood pressure instability, change in bladder or bowel function. Um, they may have sleep disorders um, that, you know, may even precede the onset of the ataxia. So it's multiple system and it's multiple system ataxia. It goes beyond the cerebellum. And they found this bad protein that builds up. And I was just having a very productive conversation with Dr. Ranum about, you know, have we found that alpha synuclein bad protein building up in any of the other cerebellar ataxias that didn't look exactly like multiple system atrophy? You know, people with ataxia, you know, without all these complications who passed away and, you know, made a brain donation and had their brain looked at, you know, have we seen that same bad protein, but maybe in smaller amounts? So I know there's been some groups looking at this, um, trying to find some common ground from garden variety adult onset ataxia to the more complicated form of MSA, something that might help us develop treatments that could be applied to all of the non-genetic ataxias. Um, and as exciting as the work in genetic ataxia is, it's already got momentum and it's moving forward quickly. And I think, you know, Dr. Ranum and myself and Dr. Wilmot and others really want to push forward with the non-genetic ataxias, the, as it were, sporadic or unknown ataxias. Um, it's important if you are developing multiple system ataxia, and usually after the first three to five years, it's clear that your ataxia is becoming more complicated. If that can be nailed down early enough, there are drug trials. There is one active drug trial going on now for MSA, and there are others in the pipeline that you can take advantage of. Selecting your care team. Everybody needs a primary care doctor. Um, and you should have a neurologist that you can go to, a local neurologist, a general neurologist, if you happen to live near an ataxia center, an ataxia neurologist, who might also be able to help you with your migraines or your back pain. Um, but some of these other people, you may see only one time, but they could have valuable input for your primary physicians. A second opinion from an ataxia expert, a genetics consultation, um, if you have some question about should I get genetic testing? My neurologist didn't really give me a clear answer. Geneticists are very good at sorting out the options and the choices with genetic testing and also interpreting genetic test results. What does that variant of unknown significance in the ataxia type 5 gene really mean? Um, you know, my neurologist couldn't give me a clear answer. Physical therapy, consultations for um, assistive devices, braces, um, an occupational therapist, a speech and swallowing therapist, a nutritionist, a social worker, or a psychologist. All of these are people that might be able to give you information and tools to tackle particular challenges you have in those areas. And then you may be seeing subspecialists for vision problems or heart issues or sleep problems or pain, pain management. Nobody should have pain. Pain is extremely treatable and very disabling. So if you are having pain as a secondary factor of your ataxia syndrome, it needs to be treated and it can be completely treated. Mayo Clinic did a study, what people want in a doctor. Um, and these were some of the things that, that came out and I kind of highlighted the two that patients in the breakout groups were commenting on. They want a doctor that tells you in plain language and a forthright manner what is going on. They don't want somebody who's going to beat around the bush or be too vague. They also want a doctor who will listen to them and take their input seriously. Um, and then some of these other things, um, you know, showing that they're conscientious and persistent and they're not going to give up. Um, and so many of the other things that will make a doctor a good doctor. So medication, there are still no cures for ataxia, but symptoms can be treated. If you're put on a new medicine for ataxia, give it at least a month to work. Um, the dose may need to be increased. If you have side effects, report them right away. You may cut the dose back, but don't stop it without talking to your doctor because some drugs should not be stopped cold turkey. Baclofen is one of them. Um, unless you're having an allergic reaction, in which case, you know, notify your doctor, stop the medication, but be sure to, you know, connect with your doctor. You know, is there any problem that I cold turkey this drug that caused me to break out in a rash? Take care of your general health. Exercise regularly. 
um, possibly use an antioxidant vitamin. There are no proven studies of any antioxidant vitamins slowing up progression of ataxia. But there's a lot of, you know, blogging and chatter um, and reports that antioxidants can help with fatigue, um, can help with strength, can help with pain. I mean, there are definitely some things that an antioxidant vitamin could be helpful with. Um, so any new exciting treatments, any new herbs, any new antioxidants that you've, you've seen or heard about, before trying them, talk to your doctor about it. Um, some of them may have side effects. Some herbal preparations may interact with your prescription medications. Um, some great new stem cell therapy in China that forces you to mortgage your house to go there may not have any good results at all for ataxia and is not worth going to. So I think it's important to have at least one doctor that you can bounce these ideas off of and get turnaround not six months later at your next visit, but right away. So I make a point of conducting a lot of my between visit practice via email. Um, I have it constantly up and running in between patients. I'll go back to email um, in the evening, in the morning, you know, before clinic starts. I'll, I'll check my emails. And the ones that I'll focus on are the ones I get from patients. The ones from my colleagues, all right, they can wait a day. But at least the patients, you know, I think deserve to have their questions answered in a timely fashion. Um, if you're depressed, talk to someone about it and consider medication. Depression really lets the air out of your tires, and any symptoms you're already having, if you're depressed, is going to make those symptoms worse. If you can get your mood back up to a stable level, get those serotonin levels up again, even if it takes medication, it can absolutely improve your performance and day-to-day -day activities. Goals for everyone. No falling, no choking, no infections, including no decubitus ulcers or bed sores, restful sleep, good energy and no pain. And these should be, these are the questions I ask, you know, have you had any falls, any choking episodes? Um, how's your general health? Any recent infections? Are you sleeping well? Are you having fatigue? Um, are you having any pain? And then we launch into, you know, how's your ataxia doing? These drugs are on, uh, I think, one of the handouts that the National Ataxia Foundation has prepared. They are drugs that if you typed into any search engine, treatment ataxia, articles in the medical literature would come up. You know, a single case report, a small series, an actual trial where there was a placebo as well as the drug being tested for ataxia. Um, and all of these in some, some researchers' hands have had some benefit for the symptoms of ataxia. Um, I underlined the four that probably have the most as it were, solid research. I know the one at the bottom, the varenicline, the Shantix study, um, which was done only in spinal cerebellar ataxia type 3 in a small number of patients. Um, I was part of that study. You know, it, the statistics suggested there was a benefit for balance, but, and statistics are important. You know, statistics say it works. Probably it works. But varenicline or Shantix, the stop smoking drug, does have a lot of side effects and it may make its use for just treating the symptoms of ataxia impractical. If, on the other hand, you're trying to stop smoking, you know, you might get a side benefit of some improved balance. However, amantadine, buspirone, and riluzole um, have, I think, reasonable evidence behind them that even though they're off-label, amantadine is an anti-flu agent, Buspar is an anti-anxiety agent, and Raluzole is approved only for Lou Gehrig's disease, so all the use would be off-label. But there is some evidence that they can help with balance and coordination um, and may be worth a try. Side effects, amantadine can be very constipating. Buspar can make you feel spacey. Raliazole, you have to get liver tests checked periodically. But, you know, I think they're worth a try. I put a little star, an asterisk, by the ones that may also be neuroprotective. Somebody asked me yesterday if um, a particular drug that they were using for symptoms of ataxia, you know, they heard that it might also protect the nerves and slow up progression. I don't know that these actually slow up progression because the studies that were done for their symptomatic benefit probably weren't long enough. But um, there is animal evidence with the ones that have little stars next to them that they could be protecting nerves um, at, at a very basic level. 
Um, so riluzole may help your ataxia, but over the long haul, it may help slow up progression. And again, all of this is off-label. None of these drugs are approved for ataxia, but most of my patients have tried at least three or four of them. Um, on the right-hand side, drugs used for tremor, for myoclonus, which is a form of tremor, and nystagmus. Long list, I have people who have tried everything on that list. Um, I think tremor can sometimes be very hard to control. Nystagmus can be even harder to control. Those are abnormal eye movements that can contribute to dizziness and imbalance. But it's worthwhile going through a checklist um, and just trying one and, you know, do it for a month or six weeks, move on to the next one until you find one that might work for you. I mean, this is, you know, kind of my small form of personalized medicine. Each patient, I look at this list I don't just blanket put everybody on amantadine. I try to pick the ones in an order that are going to give us the most benefit and hopefully the most information. Even drugs that don't work, you can learn from. These are drugs used for fatigue. Fatigue is very common in ataxia. Um, probably none of them work that well. Um, modafinil and armodafinil, which are halfway down the list, are drugs that are approved for people that have excessive daytime sleepiness due to a sleep problem, but they've had some off-label use for fatigue in neurologic illnesses, multiple sclerosis where fatigue is common, so they, they might be helpful. An activating or energizing antidepressant like fluoxetine, Prozac, sertraline, Zoloft might also help fatigue at low dose even if you're not depressed. A lot of people use caffeine for fatigue. I think it's one of the most common things people self-medicate with. And as I said, sometimes antioxidant vitamins, B-complex vitamins, can improve energy levels. Non-drug approaches are also useful for fatigue. Um, first of all, make sure you don't have another illness going on. Second of all, if you've been on a prescription drug for another health problem, sometimes those drugs can cause fatigue. You need good nutrition. You need some kind of gentle conditioning exercise that you do on a regular basis, um, even if you can't do a, a full-out you know, Olympic press for exercise. Um, weight management. You don't want to be too skinny. You don't want to be overweight um, because those can contribute to fatigue. Pain can sap your energy. Poor sleep can make you tired the next day. And you do have to pace yourself. You have to pace your activities. You don't want to push, 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 as many people were doing at the conference here, and then spend two days in bed because you're too exhausted to get up. So I think knowing yourself, knowing your activities, knowing what you want to do, putting in the big rocks first as that, you know, old, um, you know, kind of consciousness raising talk is you put the big rocks in first, the things that are so important that you need to get them done. And then you put in, you know, the little rocks and pebbles and sand afterward, the things that may be less important. Um, and I think the end of that was there's always room for beer. But, um, you know, I think we, we don't have to suffer with fatigue. We don't have to suffer with pain. These are treatable conditions. Exercise always helps. And we did have a very good presentation um, on Friday from a physical therapist about that. They can help you with establishing a good exercise program. Other rehabilitation groups can help with safe mobility, driving assessment, um, independence and activities of daily living, um, you know, gadgets to help you do things better. Someone just demonstrated a cute little finger pen that's impossible to drop. Um, and if you have ataxia, even if you can use a regular pen, it's so easy to slip out of your hand. This was a really cool device. Um, things to help improve um, speech. Um, and there'll be somebody um, presenting later this morning about that. Um, counseling and therapy to help with swallowing, with nutrition, um, safe airway, making sure that, you know, you're not having sleep apnea, that you're not getting short of breath during the day, and then control of deconditioning fatigue and pain. Physical therapy and other rehabilitation specialists outside of what the doctor does can help you with each of these areas. Even if your doctor hasn't been particularly helpful with, um, you know, your complaints of fatigue, one of these therapists may have other ideas for you. Nutrition, same thing. Um, weight maintenance, supplements if you do have a deficiency in vitamin D or something like that. Enough fiber and fluid to stabilize your bowel function. Um, carefully chosen pre-exercise supplements. A lot of our younger people who are into, you know, really good exercise, bodybuilding, strength building, 
um, will use supplements prior to exercise. They often contain creatine. They may contain caffeine. You know, they contain a lot of sugar sometimes. So, you know, if, if you're going to be starting a pre-exercise supplement, and I'm glad to say many of my patients will bring me the labels and say, is this safe to use? Um, or you can ask a nutritionist, is this safe to use? Um, gluten-free diet. Um, if you have gluten sensitivity, this is very important. There's no evidence that if you don't have gluten sensitivity, it will help. But the gluten-free diet does help you cut back on carbs. And sometimes controlling your carbs can help energy levels. Um, I've had patients who have gone to a concert, you know, they ate a big fat brownie during the intermission, and by the end of the concert, they couldn't get up and walk out of the theater. So, you know, I think it's important to look at our overall diet health and not just gluten free or the Atkins diet or some of the fad diets that are out there, but, you know, to be sure that, you know, we're having a balanced diet. Um, very restrictive diets, um, you can try them for a short period of time, but there's a risk you're going to become deficient in micronutrients. Um, you might not be getting enough protein. You might not be getting enough um, fiber or certain vitamins. So I think if you're going to try something that's truly restrictive, make sure that you have a nutritionist who can make sure that you're not losing out on what are called micronutrients. And there are no diets proven to cure ataxia. Equipment. Um, I love the Internet. You can find pictures of just about anything. Um, occupational therapists are especially good at helping us find equipment to make our daily lives easier. They also do computerized driver evaluations to see how eye-hand coordination is and to help with adaptive driving equipment. Um, physical therapists can help with choosing the right walker, um, how to use a cane, is a foot brace going to help you, um, other types of mobility devices and transfer devices. And video game pl playing has been shown to help hand coordination. So I think we all need to, to recognize that, it, that, that there is a new generation here. Support services. Um, we've heard from several people about, you know, things outside of medical needs that there are resources for. Um, genetic counseling, psychosocial counseling, home health assistance, legal aid, the support group network that can provide you know, an enormous amount of support in ways that we may not even realize we need. Decisions about taking disability, type of disability, insurance issues, and financial concerns, you may need to get a professional person, a lawyer, a financial um, analyst, somebody to help you figure out what do I do when I have to take a disability retirement from work? What's going to happen to my finances? Am I eligible for this particular insurance program? Um, should I get genetic testing? Will it affect my insurance? Um, or my ability to get insurance. So, you know, there certainly is a lot of support that we can get from non-MDs um, that can answer questions. Getting information, you go on the internet, type in a taxi on Google, you get seven million hits. Not particularly helpful. Um, National Taxi Foundation website and its links have, I think, more focused information. Clinicaltrials.gov can keep you up to date on current clinical trials for ataxia or your specific type of ataxia. You can get information from your healthcare provider. You can get it from your co-pilot who may be out there doing research for you. Other ataxians, um, social media, support group, birds of a feather. I think we had some very good discussions here about exercise and what works and what may not work. Um, but you need to control the flow of information that you're getting. Um, you don't want to drown. And I think by the end of the first three days of the investigators meeting, I felt almost like I was drowning because there was so much good stuff that I wanted to put into practice right away. So you need to portion it out. I'm going to look at some of the new research in spinocerebellar ataxia, which Dr. Wilmot is going to be presenting. And then, you know, next week I'm going to go through the Friedreich's ataxia research in more detail. So I think for you, you need to control the flow of information so you can really digest it and then prioritize it. Getting involved to master ataxia. We already know these things. Most of you are doing these things. Joining the National Ataxia Foundation, signing up in the registry, finding a support group or ambassador near you or starting one. Um, carefully explore social media. Um, there are people out there with wrong information. There are people out there with bad attitudes. There are people out there to take advantage of you. So you do have to be a careful consumer of anything that you find, you know, and basically on the Internet or in life as well. Volunteer for studies and clinical trials. If you don't step up, we will never get these studies done. 
Um, empower your doctor. The more your doctor knows about ataxia, the more likely they will want to work with you and not just say goodbye, I'll see you in 10 years. Use information to open dialogues with your family, friends, healthcare providers. I've had some wonderful discussions in my office when somebody brings in an article they saw. Here's a new drug for ALS. Will this help me? And we talk about what that drug is doing, what their ataxia is doing, why that may be a future match or not. Um, keep a short list of whom to go to when you have questions. You don't want to ask 10 different people, get 10 opinions, and then you still aren't any further ahead. Have one or two go-to people that you ask your question of. One may be your health care provider. One may be a fellow ataxian. And see if you can get a quick and reliable answer to those questions without getting overwhelmed or getting misinformation. Quick links, um, you know, and these are, you know, the registry, the CORDS registry. Um, NAF website has a lot of really good links as well as links to um, finding an ataxia doctor near you. Finding a research center, I put up our contact person for the CRCSCA, which is the Collaborative Research um, Consortium or whatever CRC stands for, um, for spinal cerebellar ataxia. We hope to be formalizing that um, coordinator position um, I mean, the, the woman who is in it now is wonderful, but you know, she does have a job. Um, so, you know, if you want to find a research center, not just an ataxia doc, at least at this time, I, I think her email address is a good place to start. Um, and then the CCRNFA, the CureFA website, um, you can find um, a Friedrichs ataxia research center near you as well. And they also have a registry just for FA. Finding research studies near you, clinicaltrials.gov. Little instructions, keywords to use, um, ataxia, multiple system atrophy. Um, most of the research centers will also have information about clinical trials. And new studies are opening up all the time. If you go to the CureFA website or the um, CRC um, SCA contact person and one of their research centers, there may be small studies happening close to where you are that aren't even listed on clinicaltrials.gov. So stay engaged. You know, they may need 10 patients to donate a blood sample and you're 10 miles away. Do it. Um, don't hold back because this research is not going to move forward without your participation. We've gone way beyond just dealing with the ataxia mouse. Some of the studies are natural history studies. They're biomarker studies where they're going to ask for a sample of skin or a sample of blood. There may be genetic studies um, and some are treatment studies. These are pharmaceutical companies with ataxia drugs in the pipeline. I'm not going to put down what the drugs are. There are others that haven't gone public yet, and I can't really put their names up there. But look at all the interest we have from big pharma. This is what is going to get us across the finish line with the first cures for ataxia. And you can go to their websites. Um, you can go to their websites, and you look at their pipeline, and you see where the drugs are. This is a study that is available now for people with MSA, multiple system atrophy. If you have been given that diagnosis, if you think you have MSA, call the information center in the United States. They've got um, seven sites that are conducting this drug trial. I think there's a couple of sites in Canada. There are sites in Europe. Um, you owe it to yourself to call even to find out that you don't qualify. It's a first step, and there will be many more drug trials. So these are the people we work with at UCLA. This is my clinical research team for neurogenetic disorders. Um, wonderful group of people. Five years ago, it was half that size. So we are really growing, and the other people I collaborate with around the country are building as quickly as we are. The, I think the future has never looked brighter. So I'd like to thank the people who have supported my work, you know, the associations, um, the nonprofits, and especially the families, you know, who have gone together um, and, and really contributed even modest amounts to push our research forward at UCLA, and certainly everybody here that is supporting the work of the National Ataxia Foundation. So thank you.